here install the bay ones? Everybody else, did other people install the Docker? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back, and please uh, welcome uh, Josh Burkers, who is here to talk about PostgreSQL replication. Uh, I hope you all enjoy it, and please raise your hand if you have any question. Thank you. Okay. So welcome everybody uh, to the PostgreSQL replication mini tutorial. Um, there's a few things before we get started. First of all, uh, there were some exercises in a virtual environment to download and install on your laptop before you got here. Um, if you haven't done it, you'll just have to follow along with what I do on screen. Um, everybody else should be able to go through it. Um, in the Git checkout, and in a directory in that virtual machine are those exercises as a text file so that you can do copy and paste um, for some of the longer command lines. Uh, the, this is actually the cut down version of a four hour tutorial um, which we'll be going through the first three or four sections of. Uh, hmm? Hello? Okay, which we'll be going through the first three or four sections of. Uh, you're welcome to continue with the self-paced exercises and directions after the tutorial. Um, if any, are any of you going to be at the longer version of this in Wellington as well? Okay, well, that makes sense. Um, I'll be doing a longer version of this in Wellington next week, but I believe that's already sold out. So um, even if you are in Wellington, it doesn't help you much. The, um, so... Uh, and the other thing I wanted to do was apologize to any VI users because apparently the version of VI on that Docker image is still broken um, and you'll have to use Nano to edit things. So, sorry about that. Um, first time doing this in Docker, so I did not notice that. So, let's talk a little bit about this. Um, the, uh, I'm on the PostgreSQL core team, if you didn't know. Um, I do a lot of Postgres stuff, uh, including training, um, and including setting up replication for clients. Um, the purpose of this tutorial is to actually cover the basic built-in tools and methods for replication. There are a bunch of management tools that are available in order to manage some of this stuff at a higher level for you. But I find, first of all, the built-in base level tools are actually not that hard. And second, before you rely on a management tool, it's really important to understand what it's doing under the hood. Um, and so that's what you're going to learn here, is what the basics are of Postgres replication um, on the command line and in the Postgres core, so that if necessary, you can write your own tools um, to integrate them into your environment. Um, so we'll be covering the first couple of sections of this. So basic asynchronous replication, uh, replication configuration, uh, some tools and monitoring. Um, depending on how the time goes, we'll get to archiving and file-based replication um, on this. Uh, maybe even failover. We will see. Things that I'm not even going to attempt to cover. Uh, disaster. Disaster recovery planning. Uh, third-party tools, application design, other forms of replication, point-in-time recovery, too much stuff. So, first of all, let's explain. So this is all about binary replication. Let me explain what binary replication is. Um, and by the way, for those of you, particularly for those of you who are using Vagrant, you should bring it up now because it takes a little while. Um, for Docker, you can set it up later, except that you just want to make sure that it's working. So, let's start out with some terminology. Um, the for so the built-in replication for Postgres, at least up until very recently, is what's known as single master replication. As in, there is one read-write server and a number of read-only servers that receive data. 
And there's different terms used in the database industry for these things. Uh, the one used in the PostgreSQL documentation is master standby. Um, I find that a little bit confusing for pure replication when you're not looking at necessarily a failover configuration. So I tend to use the terms master replica, but these mean the same thing. Now, I also talk about this as binary replication. And what makes it binary as opposed to other forms of replication. There's, there's three basic sort of forms of replication for uh, SQL relational databases. Actually, it's true even of non-relational databases. Um, one is statement replication, the second is row replication, and the third is binary replication. And these replicate, respectively, queries, rows, and data pages. So for statement replication, which is pretty much the first kind of replication that every new database system starts with because the easiest to implement, you simply send any write statements get sent to all nodes. And then you try to work out any inconsistencies between how the nodes process those write statements. Um, there's a lot of examples of this within the Postgres and other world. Uh, PG Pool 2's built-in replication, Grid SQL, uh, which is now called Stato, uh, Cluster JDBC, etc. Um, the replication that came with MySQL version 3 was pure statement replication. Our second replication mechanism, um, and something that's been around in Postgres for a while, is what we call row-based replication. And with row-based replication is the writes go to a single master, and then ver the new versions of the rows from the various tables get distributed to the replicas from that single master. Um, this is better than statement-based replication for most things because you eliminate a lot of inconsistencies around, for example, timing. Um, and random changes and statements that fail on one server but not on the others. And there's a number of systems to do this within the Postgres world, Sloney 1, Lundista, Bucardo. Um, current MySQL built-in replication is essentially role-based replication. Um, and we're going to be returning to role-based replication uh, while well, we are returning to role-based replication with Postgres 9.4. Um, which offers a new option for that. And I'll mention that later, although I won't really have time for a demo. Now, what we're going to be going over in this tutorial is what's known as binary replication. In the case of binary replication, what happens is a single master receives writes. And then those writes are distributed to the replicas as binary blocks of data. That is, chunks of the table files themselves get distributed. Um, uh, for those of you familiar with DRVD, how many people here have used DRVD? So you can think of this as sort of a form of dedicated PostgreSQL DRVD without a lot of the performance overhead. It has gone by a number of names, uh, reflecting a lot of its development history. One of them is streaming replication, which refers to the ability to stream data changes over a database connection. It's also called hot standby, um, which refers to the ability of standby servers, otherwise known as replicas, to run read-only queries while in standby mode. And that's as opposed to another term we use called warm standby, which is where you have a read-only server that is not able to accept requests, but is able to get promoted to master node very quickly. The advantages of binary replication compared to other forms of replication are that it's low administration, there's very low overhead on the master, um, for having replicas. It's non-invasive. It's, it's completely agnostic to what's going on in your application. Low latency. Um, and it's good for large databases because your copies are basically block-based disk copies. So you're doing a lot of sequential reads, which is faster. There are some disadvantages, though. When you're replicating Postgres, you're replicating your entire Postgres installation, what's known as the, the Postgres instance or PG data directory, or confusingly enough, cluster. Um, which is a, a term from the SQL standard. Um, so you can't replicate just one table or just one database within a group of databases or one schema or whatever. You have to replicate the whole thing. A second disadvantage is that the replicas cannot accept writes of any kind, not even temporary tables. Um, uh, there are some things that don't get replicated um, that I will mention later. Um, and there's this thing called query cancel, um, which is another drawback. Um, where the replication stream conflicts with load balancing. So, but let's go over what we're doing first and, and move into actually doing some hands-on stuff. 
um, and do some streaming asynchronous replication. This is what we should start with because this is the kind of replication that most people want most of the time. Right? You just want you want a copy of your Postgres server, you want it to be as up to date as possible without putting any load in the master, and you want to be able to fail over quickly. And that is streaming asynchronous replication for you. So let's throw some more terminology at you. Um, binary replication in Postgres actually grew out of our continuous backup feature, um, which uses another industry term called point in time recovery. And so this term recovery is used both in the replication documentation and in some file and directory names. So just understand that when you see the word recovery, that also means replication. Um, I'm going to use a couple of other terms called snapshot or clone, um, which refer to taking a point in time snap, a point in time copy of a running PostgreSQL server. And the final term is standalone, and that is a server which is read-write and is, neither a ma is not participating in replication. It's neither a master nor a replica. So here's basically how it works. You have your Postgres server. This is your master server, but right now it's a standalone. And you take a copy, a clone of this server, and then you tell that clone of that server, hey, you're a clone of this other server, so go ahead and spin up. And now, one of the important things about taking the clone of the server is that if we're just doing rsync or CP, can we take an instantaneous copy of the server so that all files are 100% consistent with each other? No. So we actually need something to bridge the gap from when we started the copy to when we finished the copy in order to make the files 100% consistent to a particular moment in time. Fortunately, built into Postgres, we actually have that kind of mechanism, which is called Postgres's transaction logs. Postgres's transaction logs are actually just a series of binary differences between before and after pictures of the files that make up your database. And so by shipping over the transaction logs from the beginning of the copy to the end of the copy, we can bring the clone up to a consistent state without needing an external mechanism to take an instantaneous point in time copy of the master and without shutting the master down. So we copy the files, we copy the transaction log, we apply those transaction log to the replica, and this is all done by Postgres machinery, but you should understand what's going on. And then we start up the replica and tell it, hey, by the way, you're a replica, so you should actually communicate with your master, which is located here. And so the replica starts up this process called the wall receiver. The wall receiver connects to the master and says, hey, I'm a replica here. The master starts up a process called the wall sender, which connects back to the replica and starts sending over a continuous stream of data changes that represent all of the rights to the master database. And then at that point you're replicating and you can repeat the process with additional servers for however many replicas you want to support. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay. So uh, this is the Docker environment. Um, for those of you who are using Docker, go ahead and do the Docker run. Um, I, I dash IT for... Um, for interactive, for those of you in Vagrant, hopefully you already brought it up, log into Vagrant. Uh, now, a couple of things. Uh, one is because we're going to be switching back and forth between different sessions, we're going to want Tmux on here. Um, is there anybody here who is unfamiliar with Tmux? Oh, a few people, okay. Um, so, Tmux is kind of Screen 2.0, if you're familiar with Screen. It's a virtual terminal or a set of virtual terminals. So, if you type that command Tmux, um, as, as root, as we just did. Um, the, uh, for those of you in Vagrant, you need to switch to root. So sudo su dash um, per the exercises. Because um, you need to start out as root here. For those of you in Docker, you start out as root. Um, so you want to go ahead and start up tmux, which has a virtual terminal here. And we're going to actually create a second virtual terminal because we need to switch back and forth. So hit control B and then the letter C without control. And that creates a second virtual terminal. And in that second virtual terminal, we're going to switch to being the Postgres user. Sorry, what was the command? Control B. Control B, and then the letter C without control. Control B, then C. Yeah, Control B, then C. So, 
And then we can switch back and forth with control B and then N. And so switch back and forth until you're back into that Postgres shell. For those of you in, for those of you in Vagrant Postgres, the master should have auto started. Um, for Docker, it won't. So we're going to actually send a command right now to start up the master. So we use, because I've arranged several different Postgres instances on this same image, um, we need to do this manually, not using the service command. Um, so there's your command to start the master here. Um, and that goes ahead and starts up the master. Okay, so now we're going to switch into the 9.4 directory. This is the directory that we're in right here. So, sorry, we don't say the same. Yeah. What? Okay. Are other people getting this to work? Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm afraid we're going to just have to push on because um, I don't have an assistant here to help people troubleshoot individual container problems. Um, the, um, so switch into the 9.4 directory here. Um, and if you actually look at that, I've set up, so each one of these directories represents a Postgres home, what we call PG data. And so we're going to spin those up at one point or another as completely separate instances of Postgres with their own master process. Now, obviously, if you were really doing replication, these would be on separate machines, um, but it wasn't really practical to set that up for a demo, uh, for a training exercise. So we're all going to be running these inside the same virtual machine or container. Um, so, uh, now the command that we use in order to do the clone is called PG Base Backup. So go ahead and, and take pull up the help for PG Base Backup because it's got a lot of sub a lot of switches available to it. Um, we're not going to be using all of these switches, but you can see what's going on there. A bunch of these are actually new for 9.4. Um, so, if you go back to your installation, your 9.3 or 9.2, um, you won't actually uh, necessarily have all of these options. Things like the max rate option to bottle, uh, to limit the amount of network bandwidth you, you use is new, um, as is the table space mapping command. Uh, we're not really going to be going over those. Um, so, I, you know, uh, you've got actually sort of your command here. We'll go over a few of these options as we do our cloning. So now we're going to actually use PG Base Backup. So dash X and dash X says also copy the transaction logs. Copy the transaction logs at the end of copying the files. There are other options, <laughs> which, which, which we'll talk about later on. Um, dash P is just show me a progress meter. That's just for interactive. And then dash D is actually fairly well required because that is telling PG Base Backup where the data directory that you're copying into is located. And that is located in, in replica one, which is currently an empty directory. And so then you should get output that looks like that. That's a little progress meter. Of course, it takes no time at all because we've got a small installation and it's local. Copying a uh, terabyte database across the network, it'll take a little bit longer. Uh, how did you figure out the source? You, you didn't specify Ah, yes. We didn't because we were using implied stuff. That, that was what effectively what we did. Yeah. Because we're just pulling from the default port on localhost. Obviously, if we were pulling from another machine, you would have to actually give it a host location to pull from. 
And by the way, if you actually try to run this a second time, uh, pg-based backup will only pull into an empty directory. Um, it, it is designed to fail if you attempt to copy it into a directory that already has stuff in it. So now, uh, we can't actually, because we're running multiple Postgres's on the same machine, we can't use the default configuration for this. So we're going to copy one that I have uh, for the exercises. And we're just going to go ahead and copy that into the replica one directory right there. And so that's copying a postgresql.conf and a recovery.conf and a bunch of other things that you'll see later. And then once you've copied that, you should be able to start it up. And if you look at the process list, ooh, there's a lot of wrapping there. Um, look at the process list, hold on, let's, let's page that. Uh, we actually have two different postmasters running on the same machine. And you can actually see some, uh, some of that other stuff I was talking about. Because we've got the replica right now telling us that it's actually slurping data from the master, which is where you see, again, recovery, it's recovering data. Um, and then we have this wall receiver process that is streaming and that sort of thing. Um, and now I'm going to actually start using port numbers because we now have two Postgres running on here. So the first one's running at port 5432. And go ahead and connect to this test database, this demo database I have called libdata. If you look in libdata, we have a small set of tables. Quit out of that. We can connect to the replica at port 5433. And again, if you look, we've copied over all of our data from the master. Now, of course, that was actually kind of simple, partly because um, the master wasn't doing anything. It was completely at rest. So how about if we actually create some traffic on the master um, to make this a little bit more interesting the, um, and to actually verify that data does ship from master to replica. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a benchmark database. So create the bench database. Okay, and that command, and I'll actually go over it again once it's done, um, because it kind of scrolled past pretty quickly. But that's the command right there. So pgbench is a micro benchmark that ships with PostgreSQL. And it's useful for doing tests like this. Don't, don't call it a real benchmark, it does a set of very simple queries repeatedly. Um, but it is useful for doing traffic tests and the like, which is what we're going to do here. And so we did, we just did in the master, was we created a database and then we populated that database with this fake mini benchmark data. Um, for, so that's pgbench-i for initialize, dash s for scale, um, dash u, capital U for what user we're doing this as, and then bench as the name of the target database. And that should go ahead and generate some data. And then, We can see we have this benchmark database created. And if we connect to the replica on port 5433, we have the same thing. 
And that's actually one of the big advantages of binary replication over row-based replication, which is it really doesn't care what you do on the master up to and including creating and dropping databases. Um, any of that stuff, it will faithfully replicate, which can actually be a drawback if you dropped a database and you didn't mean to, um, <laughs> but um, it, it will go ahead and do that. And the nice thing about that is that it keeps your ops completely separate from your development. Okay. So there we are. We're replicating asynchronously and streaming. So let's talk a little bit. Now that we've got a replica up and running, let's talk a little bit about administering it. First of all, there's a couple of configuration files. PostgreSQL.conf, which you'll be familiar with if you've run PostgreSQL before at all, um, the, um, which is our general configuration file for configuring Postgres. And there's a bunch of settings in there, both for the master and for the replica, in terms of its behavior. And then there's this special file called recovery.conf. There's that recovery word again. And recovery.conf is special because it has this weird hybrid role where it is both a trigger file that turns on replication um, and contains certain configuration options that can only show up in recovery.conf for replication. Um, so if a recovery.conf file is present when you start up Postgres, the Postgres that you start up will attempt to go into replication or point-in-time recovery mode, depending on what options you've given it in the file. If one's not present, it will not attempt to replicate. And this file always needs to go in the actual data directory, even if your configuration is normally kept somewhere else. So like if we were doing this using standard Ubuntu configuration, the configuration or Debian configuration, the configuration being et cetera, PostgreSQL, et cetera, but recovery.conf needs to go into Verilib data 9.4 main or wherever your data actually lives. So this is called linking? Sorry? Can you link it? Uh, can you, the question was, can you link it? Um, you can link it, but I actually recommend putting the actual file in the data directory and then linking it to somewhere else because one of the reasons it has to be in your data directory is that, for example, when you promote a replica to a master, Postgres moves the file. Uh, we also have a set of views and functions um, I, in order to help you administer Postgres. Um, you can obviously look at the process list like we just did, um, and that's a good method of troubleshooting when everything else has failed. Uh, but in general, you're going to be using some things. One of the things you use heavily is a view on the master called pgstat replication. Um, and pgstat replication tells you the status of all of your connected replicas. Uh, PG is in recovery, um, which will also show you, uh, which is a function you run on the replica. And a set of functions that check the status of the data stream that generally start with pgxlog. So let's actually do some of those. So, first let's actually look at the configuration here. Um, so, open your favorite editor, unless you're in Docker and your favorite editor is VI, in which case it won't work. Um, in that case, use Nano. Um, for Emacs users like me, I have a mini version of Emacs called JMax. Um, uh, otherwise, like I said, Nano's available. Uh, for anybody who just installed the image or who is on Vagrant, VI is available or Vim is available on Docker. Um, you know, otherwise, sort of pick your poison. The And we're just going to go ahead and look at some of the configuration here. So this is the configuration in the master. Um, this is a simplified Postgres configuration without all of the excess baggage that we put in the configuration file we ship with Postgres. I actually strongly recommend for people administering Postgres in production, get rid of that default postgres.conf file that ships with Postgres and put in a stripped down Postgres file that only has the options you're actually using um, because that will save you a lot of scrolling every time you want to look at something. Um, 
So most of this is your sort of basic Postgres configuration. I'm not going to go over that right now because um, it's not related to replication. Uh, instead, we're going to go over just the replication connections. So one of the things that you need to change right off when you are f going to set up something as replication that is not turned on by default for security reasons is, well, actually for performance reasons, it's not turned on by default. There's this parameter called wall level, and wall level says, how much stuff am I writing to the transaction log? There is, um, the default we ship with is minimal, as in write the minimum to the transaction log in the state for crash recovery. But that doesn't contain some extra data that we need for replication for the replica to read. So in order for replication to work, wall level needs to be set to hot standby, or the next higher level, which is what I have set here, which is logical. And logical is strictly 9.4. So if you're using 9.3 or earlier, you want to set this to hot standby. The second thing that you have to do is, remember I said that, that the streaming is coming from this process called the wall sender, which is a process run by the master. It's actually several processes run by the master that form the end of a socket that we're sending data over. Um, so this max, uh, sorry, max wall senders right here is how many of those am I allowed to have? And by default, in most packaging, this is actually set to zero. The reason it is set to zero is for out-of-the-box security. Because if it's set higher than zero out-of-the-box, and you have not configured your replication security, then somebody can use it as a vector to hack your master server. Um, uh, next one is called wall keep segments. I will be going over that uh, later in the presentation, uh, hopefully. Um, that has to do with telling the master to hold on to extra data that the replica might need. Um, max replication slots is part of the new 9.4 replication slot feature. Uh, we probably won't have time for that today. Um, and then there's a couple of ones. The other one for the master is well sender timeout is simply how often does the master ping the replica if it hasn't heard from it in a while. And we're not going to go over the rest of these right now. Those, those are the essential ones on the master um, for the initial configuration. Now, um, if you look at replica one's postgresql.conf, you'll see, take a look at the second section of the configurations called the replica. So one of the first things that you'll see actually, if you look at both of those files is, Aside from the port number, we are using the same configuration file for the master and for the replica. And that's one of the things that we did in Postgres 9.1 um, is if you are a master, the replica options will be ignored. And if you are a replica, the master options will be ignored. Um, and that's a useful thing because it means that you can actually put the same file in the configuration management system for all of your servers. Uh, there are a couple of things. So quirk number one, which I actually don't have on the screen right now, max connections. Um, the replica and binary replication must have max connections set to the same number or higher as the master. The reason for that is within the Postgres system catalog, we use those connection slots to keep track of new data coming in from the master. And if you set the replica to a lower max connections, then it can't actually replicate all the data the master is sending it and will fail. Um, so some of the other things for this. So there's this parameter called hot standby. Um, and hot standby is a Boolean parameter, on or off. And it basically says, OK, I'm a replica. Am I taking requests? That is, am I allowing users to connect with me and run read-only queries? If hot standby is on, that's yes. If hot standby is off, that's no. One of the reasons why that might be no, for example, is if you have a replica that is a dedicated backup failover and you don't want to ever run any load on it, that might cause it to fall behind the master. Um, better to just limit who can connect to it because you do kind of want to run queries on that to make sure it's still responding. Um, but you can turn it off. The second thing is there are a couple of timeouts. Uh, there are a couple of delays here. Um, this has to do with what's called query cancel, which is um, if load on the replica is conflicting with replication, 
how long do I wait before I terminate that load on the replica so that I can catch up? Um, and I, streaming delay refers to streaming replication, archive delay refers to file-based replication. Um, hot standby feedback, um, we'll hopefully have a chance to go over later. Um, and then again, this is just a ping time. How often do I ping the master if I haven't heard from it in a while? And then the last thing that we want to look at here is that reco special recovery.conf file I talked about. So this is a separate configuration file. Right now, um, because we still haven't fixed this, um, it's a little bit, the formatting is a little bit different from the standard postgres.conf. Um, that's something that's been our to-do list for a while and will finally be fixed in 9.5. But for now, just keep in mind that you have to quote most parameters, which is not true in postgres.conf. So we've got a few things. Number one is we have the standby mode parameter. And the standby mode, once again, says, um, am I a replica? This, is, this, this actually could be called as a parameter, am I a replica? Um, it's called standby mode largely for historical reasons. The reason why this would be off is that we use the same replication mechanisms to recover Postgres from a binary backup. And so if you were recovering a binary backup and not running a replica, standby mode would be off. But anytime you're doing replication, standby mode is going to be on. The second one right here, primary con info, um, is the connection string in Postgres connection string format to connect to the master in order to replicate. Um, you know, what host are we connecting to? What port are we connecting to? What user are we connecting as? Um, and then there's this extra parameter called application name. This is optional, but I highly suggest that you set it because that application name is just a tag. It can be any arbitrary string, but that tag gets passed up to the master and is then visible in the administrative views on the master, and that really helps you distinguish one replica from another, as opposed to trying to track them by IP address, which is your other choice. Um, other things can be put in the connection info. Um, for example, if you're using password, yes? Um, so obviously you have to have the role set up in the master. The question was you have to have the role set up in the master, and the answer is yes, and I will be going over that. Um, so you can put in other things in here, like you, know, you can put a password in the, the con info. Um, I suggest that you don't do that, and I'll show you some other mechanisms for if you need password authentication, because there are circumstances where that connection string is visible to unprivileged users, um, and so putting a password in there is a bad idea. The, um, uh, you know, and you can put other things, you can, this supports SSL, so if you have installed Postgres with SSL support, you can tell it to use an SSL, an SSL connection for replication and similar things. Um, one of these other things here, um, and I'll mention this now because we're not going to get to this section of the tutorial, um, uh, that has to do with remastering. Um, and remastering is when server one was the master and server two is now the master and you want all of the remaining replicas to read from server, to connect and read from server two. Um, you need this cryptic parameter called recovery target timeline equals latest. Um, and that is a cryptic way of saying if the replication stream changes, follow it. Um, because if you don't have that in there, the moment that the replica notices that it's getting a different replication stream than what it was getting before, it will stop replicating. So just set that. And so that is our recovery.conf. We will be adding and changing things in recovery.conf as we go along, and so you'll get more familiar with it. Okay, so. Uh, now again, do the tmux switch thing, control B, and switch back to the root shell. Um, I said we were going to create some load to actually make this more interesting. So get into the setup PG bench directory, where I've set up some fake benchmarks that generate a little bit of traffic. And the first of this is just the script runbench.sh. And so that will start up. And then control B and switch back to the Postgres shell. And we're going to switch back to the Postgres shell 
um, and log into the bench database on the master. So port 5432, database bench. So we're going to look at the PG Bench history. The PG Bench history table is an audit table for this micro benchmark. So it's continuously getting new records as the micro benchmark runs. If you run this several times, you can see that that's increasing. Now let's actually take a look at some of the other stuff. So PG Stat Activity is your view in Postgres to what are all of my concurrent connections on the server, what's going on on the server. So we can look in PG Stat Activity. Oh, that backslash edge switch is to switch from landscape to portrait mode for output because this is a very wide system view and otherwise it wraps around a lot. So this shows that we've got a couple of connections going on for this benchmark that are running queries on the benchmark. Now, I said that one of your main uh, ways of administering replication is this PG stat replication view. So if you look here for PG stat replication, there's exactly one row because we have one replica connected. Um, we've got some not as useful information on what's the, well, the process ID can be useful. So we've got a process ID. Uh, we've got some Postgres internal information on this. We've got what username is it connecting as. Uh, that application name. See, this is where you should put in, even though it's an optional parameter, you should put in that application name because it's visible here in uh, PG stat replication and makes it really easy and fast to identify which replica is which. Um, then client address and host name, which aren't populated here because we're connecting over localhost. Uh, you know, the port number that was assigned, which you don't really care about. Um, when it actually backend start is when it actually connected. Um, and then we have a bunch of status information. And this, this is actually where it's much more useful for monitoring. So that state that we're in is streaming, which means that we are actively streaming replication. There are several different, there are a few different states. The main ones that you will see are streaming um, and pending. And pending is when we've caught up, when we've connected to the master, but we haven't yet caught up to the point where the replica is streaming new data. And that'll generally happen right after you've cloned a new replica and you've started it up, but it hasn't gone live yet. Um, if you have a very large, very high traffic database, it'll actually be in that state for a while because it'll take it a while to catch up. Uh, then we've got all these locations and those hexadecimal strings represent positions in the transaction log um, for Postgres. Um, I, and, the, um, and those tell us what is going on in terms of sending data to the replica. Those are four different locations. Sent is what data did we last send to the replica? Write is, what data did the replica last accept? Uh, flush is, what data did the replica last write to its own transaction log? And replay is, what data did the replica last apply to its version of the tables in memory? So the one that you actually care about the most here is actually replay. Because replay shows you your level of consistency between the master and the replica. And you'll notice, by the way, that we are caught up on sent, write, and flush, but it's replay that's behind. And that's usually the case. I mean, in this case, it's only about 16 bytes behind, but. Um, and I'll show you some functions to actually make use of these cryptic numbers, which otherwise are not very human readable. Uh, there's a couple of other columns in here, sync priority and sync state, refer to doing synchronous replication. If we were doing synchronous replication rather than asynchronous replication, then this replica would have a sync priority which said where it was in the preference for synchronous replicas um, and whether or not it was currently synced. In this case, you see the sync state is async, in indicating that we are uh, doing asynchronous replication. So one of the problems with those locations is that they are hexadecimal strings that are interpreted according to a bunch of math about how we lay out our transaction log files, um, which is not very helpful in determining how far is this replica actually behind. 
So what you want to do is you want to actually use some of our built-in functions. Well, there's this function called pgxlog location diff that will take any of those two, any two of those location strings and give you the number of bytes that are different. So So for example, if we want to see if we want to see how much lag there is in applying um, new data on the replica, we could compare the write location with the replay location. And here we get 544 bytes of difference, which is a very small lag. Um, in real production monitoring, I would recommend actually using standard divide by 1024 to roll this up into K or megabytes. Um, but um, that tells you, in terms of volume of data, how far you are behind. And you actually look at this a couple of times, and you'll see that this goes up and down um, as new data gets written and as the replica catches up from new data being written. In regards to monitoring, at what value would you alert in a production database? The question was, uh, at what value would you alert in a production database? And that actually comes strictly down to an operational decision of how far of how far behind your replicas can get before it's a problem. Um, and part of that depends on how much traffic you're doing. Because in a database like this, where we're only writing a few bytes a minute, if we were to fall a megabyte behind, that would be an indication of a major problem. In a database where you're doing 100,000 transactions per minute, being a megabyte behind would be doing very well. So um, a few other I, uh, so let's actually look at what we can do on the replica, because that's, that's looking at stuff from the master. And the master is the only place where you can get a view of all of the replicas at once. The replicas only know about themselves. But let's go ahead and connect to the replica. And you can see from PG Bench history here that we are receiving data that is streaming along. Now, one of the first things you want to do with a if you're doing monitoring is to connect to it as a database server and say, hey, am I a replica or not? And the am I a replica or not is actually a function called PG is in recovery. So on a replica, PG's in recovery will return true. On a master or standalone, it will return false. So for example, that's one of the things you can do in your monitoring is if according to your configuration management system, server three is supposed to be a replica and PG is in recovery is returning false, then something is wrong. So the, this uh, count 2012, what's that? Um, I'm counting the number of rows in the audit table. Um, because we're still running a benchmark in the background. And I'm just showing that data is actually flowing from the master to the replica. So, now, let's actually take a look at some of the other stuff we can look at on the replica. So, PG last xlog receive location is a function that you can run on the replica to say, what data did I last get? You know, when did I last get, you know, what data did I last get from the master? Um, now, obviously, if you're having a network lag problem, receive location will be substantially behind sent location on the master. That's a little hard to measure in monitoring because you're connecting to two different servers. And so there's no way for you to actually check that simultaneously on the master and the replica. So keep that in mind. If you set up monitoring to look for network lag by comparing sent location and receive location, keep in mind that the process of monitoring is it's itself laggy. But this tells us what data did we last receive. Um, and then there's a second one. 
And that says, what data did we last apply? This is our point at which the data becomes merged into the version of the database we have in memory on the replica. And that means And that means that we can actually compare those two on the replica to check on the replica how far we are behind. Right now this replica is keeping up pretty well. Oh. Okay, either that or a benchmark ended. Um, now. One of the things that people look at this, they say, okay, that tells me what volume of data I am behind. But what I really want to know for asynchronous replication is how far I'm behind in time. Because generally, if you, have, if you have a spec that says, you know, the replicas must be a certain amount consistent, that's expressed in time, right? The replica must be consistent within one minute. So there's a little bit of a problem with that, which is, that Postgres's transaction log does not contain a constant stream of timestamps. In fact, the only timestamp that's coming across is every time a transaction commits, you get a timestamp with that. Now, in a database where you're mostly doing single row writes, that's a pretty constant stream of timestamps. But in a database where you do big batch operations, the commit might come minutes later. So, but that's the only timestamp that we have, and so that's the one that we actually look at. So there's that function, and that gives you the timestamp of the last commit to come down the replication stream. Josh? Yes? So, server locale and date time matters here between master and replica? Um, it'll use whatever your time zone is set in the client. So whatever you've set time zone to in the client, that's what it'll use. Yes. It's, it's sending you an absolute timestamp and converting it to whatever time, time zone it thinks you want to have. In this case, I've set up the Docker image to use UTC, which means that that's what it's giving me. So, and that means that, of course, we can create a delay out of that by just subtracting it from the current timestamp. So, for example, right there, that tells me that I am uh, about half a second behind, 541 milli 542 milliseconds behind in terms of commit timestamps. Now, again, if you're using that for um, monitoring, like I said, keep in mind that these are commit timestamps, and so there will be a certain amount of stuttering. So if you're going to have this alert, it should be alerting at some whole number of several seconds. Do not set this to, you know, alert if you fall more than 10 seconds behind because you will be getting a lot of false alerts where, where the replica isn't actually behind. You just, had, you just had a brief pause in the amount of traffic on the master. Um, now, we added this function in Postgres 9.3 to allow you to dynamically stop replication without taking the replica down. And this is called PGXLog Replay Pause. And so when you run this, what it does is the replica is still receiving stuff from the master, but it's not applying any of it. Uh, is it correct spelling? Uh, wait, sorry? Uh, capital. Oh, the, I, these are case insensitive. So sorry about the capital. It's case insensitive, though. And now if we actually do that location diff query again, 
you see that we're pretty significantly behind at this point. We're 700K behind. And for that matter, if we do this, we see that we're 34 seconds behind. So the replica is... Yeah. Yeah, so the replica is still receiving data, and it's putting it in a buffer, but it is not saving it. Um, when it fills up its buffer, it will stop receiving it, um, which, which could be bad if you don't have a buffer on the master. Um, the, um, this is something you generally do in order to fix something on the replica. Um, and if we want to actually start it up again, just PGX log replay resume. And then we will resume replicating. Okay, so I did say I will go over security, um, and I will. So, there are several layers of security uh, that apply to replication in Postgres. Um, one is that the user connecting to Postgres needs to have the special replication permission in order to read a replication stream. The second is Postgres' own host-based access file, pghba.conf, that defines who can connect to Postgres and how. Um, the third part is whether you have max wall senders greater than zero and whether you have enough for how many people are connecting. And then, of course, the last is that you can use network and routing and uh, firewall configurations on the host level to secure replication. And it is really important to secure replication because if somebody can get a validated replication connection, they have a copy of your entire database, um, including, by the way, passwords. So you really don't want somebody illegitimate to get, I mean, we hash the passwords inside Postgres, but if somebody has a copy of the database and lots of time, they can crack that hash. Um, uh, I'll tell you, <laughs> the, um, the assumption is if somebody gets that, that file and gets, has an unlimited amount of time, they're going to break it. So, um, so you do want to secure replication, and for that matter, Postgres ships with replication locked down out of the box, which is unfortunate for people who are just getting started because it means they try to start up a replica and they can't do anything. But we couldn't see another way to do it because the danger of having an unsecured replication connection is too bad. So you actually do have to change some of those things when you get set up. So now, in the image, of course, I already changed permissions so that we could have a replica. But when you're setting up replication in the Postgres server for the first time, you will have to change permissions yourself. So let's switch terminals within Tmux, Control-B-N. Uh, excuse me. Yeah? Uh, I'm afraid that uh, Postgres 2 is absolutely jam-packed, so I'm going to need to stop um, the, um, so we're going to actually go over some of the security. So switch users back to the root user, control BN, and hit control C to stop the benchmark from running. And now we will switch back to the Postgres user. And we're going to shut down the replica, PG control dash D, capital D, replica one stop. So we've just shut down the replica. And we're going to undo our previous work and we're going to wipe out that whole directory. RMRF replica one slash star. Make sure that you have replica one slash star and not just star. Um, now. Oh. Um. I just realized that actually I jumped ahead in the exercises be because I got distracted. I'm sorry, we're going to need to set up replication again because that was actually getting ahead in the exercises. So we're actually going to, if anybody has not already done the RMRF star, then don't do it. Um, for those of you who did do it, um, we're going to restore the replica. So do PG base backup dash X dash P dash D replica one right there and then copy the configuration. And 
and then go ahead and bring it up. Okay, sorry about that. A little bit extra tutorial training here. So for those of you who are looking at the exercises worksheet, I just, because I accidentally jumped ahead to the next exercise because of the interruption, I just redid the initial replica setup, right, where it says basic two-node replication in order to get replica one working again. So we're going to now actually go through some of the security setup here. So the first thing that I said was that we need a replica permission. Now one of the things that I actually, the one user out of the box in Postgres, database user, that has the replica permission automatically is the Postgres user, the super user that owns the installation. However, in a secure setup, I actually recommend creating and using a different dedicated replication user. Because among other things, if you actually have to look at security on the network or process level, it's very helpful to have that second user so you can identify which one is the replication connection. Um, and it means that if you have to change the password for the Postgres user because it's been compromised, you don't have to change it for the replication user. So let's connect to the master. And we're going to create a dedicated replication user. So we're creating a role named replicator with the password replicate. Um, please do use that because I've set it up in some of the other configuration files and some of the rest of the tutorial, you'll have to fix things if you choose a different password. Um, create role replicator password replicate. So I'm going to a password because we use password authentication here. And then I need to give it two permissions. I need to give it the login permission so it can connect to begin with. And I need to give it the replication permission so that it can replicate. And if you actually look at the user's view, backslash du, you can actually see right there, we've got our users and we have uh, the Postgres super user, of course, has all permissions in the world, and the replicator has just the replication permission. So quit out of that. And then again, use your We're going to get into the, the eight host-based access file for Postgres. So ed, uh, editor master slash pghba.conf. And we're going to actually change this. So initially when we actually set this up, I just set it up so that we could have trust authentication, so passwordless authentication uh, with the uh, Postgres user to do replication so that we could get a quick start here. But now we're going to set up with a more secure configuration where only this dedicated replicator user can connect and it has to use a password. So comment out those three lines. So, so the Postgres user will no longer be able to connect uh, for replication purposes. So we're going to comment out those three lines. And when we comment out those three lines with the host-based access file, it keeps looking down until it finds a matching line and then applies the rule in that line. It's like IP tables. So by commenting out those three lines, the next set are going to take effect. And we've now said that the replicator user has replication permission. And you can see here we are using password, uh, hash passwords as authentication. So go ahead and save that. Now, we've just changed the user and the authentication method, which means we're going to need to tell the replica to connect in a different way. So let's go ahead and do that. So here we are in the recovery.conf file in replica one. So we need to change, the first thing we need to change here is that user. 
So that needs to change right there in the primary con info parameter. So change it to user right here, replicator. And go ahead and save. Now, one of the problems that came up, I said, I said you could put the password in that primary con info parameter. But I really don't recommend that because depending on how processes are set up in your system, that primary con info string may be visible in the process list. Um, in the future in Postgres 9.5, we're going to make it visible in a system view so that you can actually check the connection string. But then that means that people can get the password. Yes? Sorry, in the Joe editor, I'm in the um, Docker container. Hmm? The Joe, Joe text editor, how do you save the file? Oh, uh, so doing standard Joe? Uh, hit hit Control C, and yeah. you should be able to say yes to save it. No? Loose changes to this file, yes or no? Because no, when you go back to the. Oh. I don't remember how to use the standard Joe commands. Exit it and do it in, in nano instead. Oh, so you, you didn't update this this morning. Anybody here a regular Joe user? Just a regular Joe. <laughs> um, okay. So um, the um, anyway. Uh, so we can set that. So I recommend instead using another method of getting passwordless authentication. Now, Postgres does support more sophisticated options like SSL certificate authentication or GSS API, um, you know, or Kerberos or whatever. We're not going to do any of those right now. But what we are going to do is actually what's called the PG Pass file. So. So copy this PG Pass file into your home directory. It's in setup Postgres PG Pass. Whoa, that was my fault. Since set up Postgres PG Pass and copy it into the home directory. So the PG Pass is a dot file. Um, we need to change the permissions on it because, like other things that contain passwords, Postgres will refuse to uh, use it uh, if it is set too liberally. So change it to 700. And now let's actually take a look at it. So the PG Pass file is just a file of users and passwords. There's five fields in it separated by colons. I uh, host, port, database, user, password. This does have your passwords in plain text which is the reason for wanting to keep it in a dot file in your home directory with restrictive permissions. And if you are on some kind of hosting where that is not good enough to prevent people from accessing it, um, then you maybe don't want to use this method. Um, also, think about your PGS pass files when you're actually doing backups. Um, like if your backups are unsecured, you probably want to exclude the PG pass file from your backups. Um, but right here, this allows the replicator to connect to the master using a password non-interactively. And so that's why we're setting this up. Okay. So now we need to tell both servers to look at the changes. So we're going to tell the master reload. Which, tell, which, among other things, will have it reread its host-based access file. Now, one of the things about replication currently, um, and I say currently because we're planning to change this in 9.5, is that right now you can't change any of the parameters in that recovery.conf file without restarting the replica. That is, the replica reads those parameters only on startup. And so you need to actually do a full restart of the replica, which will kick any people who are connected to the replica off in order to do a parameter change. 
So that's what we're going to do. And if you look at the process list, we have that one replicator connection right there. If you connect to the master, you can see that our replication connection is now as the replicator user. Okay, uh, let's talk about a couple of other issues that come up uh, a lot of the time. Um, Postgres supports a robust extension system that has that includes things like PostGIS and the ISBN data type and a whole bunch of other extra functionality people like to load into Postgres. It's important to understand that the replication stream does not include the libraries that those extensions rely on. So the way that you install an extension when Postgres is being replicated is you install the libraries, the, the SO files that come in the packages, on each server, on the master and the replica, etc., using whatever installation management system you have. And then you install the extension into the, mas into the database on the master. And you need to make sure that the libraries are installed in the replica because if you install the extension in the master and the lib replica does not have those libraries, the first time it encounters the use of the extension, it will stop replication. Um, the, um, so actually, I did this for PostGIS. So, uh, a couple of other things. Um, so, one of the other limitations to binary replication is that all replicas need to be running the same version of PostgreSQL. That is, we cannot, um, we cannot have PostgreSQL 9.3 replicating to PostgreSQL 9.4 or vice versa. Um, now, this doesn't in general apply to um, minor updates. So like, for example, this is 9.4.0, the 9.4.1 update will come out probably in a couple of weeks. Um, in general, replicating from 9.4.0 to 9.4.1 or back is fine. There are exceptions to that in some of the 9.3, some of the, the older updates. Like if you haven't patched your Postgres in a while, 9.3.2 and 9.3.3 contain fixes to the replication system itself. And so I don't recommend replicating from 9.3.2 to 9.3.3 for any length of time because, because having the fix on one server and not on the other server is a problem. But so in general, um, in a replicated cluster, there's no current way within Postgres to do a rolling major version upgrade. Now, I did mention before that one of the other limitations of binary replication is that there's some stuff that does not get replicated. Number one, unlog tables. In 9.1, we introduced this feature that said that you could have tables that did less I.O. to make them faster, which were called unlog tables. Well, the thing is, we replicate via the transaction log. So if you have an unlog table on the master, it will be empty on the replica. It'll not only be empty, it will give you this warning every time you try to query it, because it'll say, you know, this is going to be empty on the replica. Um, so anything you've got in an analog table on the master is accessible only on the master. Temporary tables in Postgres are per session. And so once again, a temporary table, you can't create temporary tables in the replica, and a temporary table created in the master is not visible on any replica. Um, and we still haven't figured out how to make listen notify work across replication. It's been on the to-do list for a while, but currently it doesn't work. Yeah. Listen notify. Yes. So listen notify is an internal messaging system within Postgres that allows you to send a notification that other database clients can be listening for. It's really useful for things where you've got a bunch of asynchronous clients that you want to let them know that there's new data available. And we would like it 
that you can put the notification in the master and listen for it in the replicas. But we haven't figured out a way to make that work right now. So right now, listen notify works only on the master. So let's talk a little bit about cloning um, in the remaining time that we have um, and do some cloning exercises. So now I mentioned, so we actually did this through PG Base Backup, but let's get a little bit more in depth with it in case any of you have configurations or workloads that require using a more sophisticated approach. So here's the requirements for cloning a master in order to turn it into a replica. Um, one is you can figure out some way to actually get a genuine point in time snapshot of the database. Or, you know, you can do what PG Base Backup does under the hood, which is to copy all database files plus all transaction logs between the beginning and the end of copy. Now, the simplest way to do this is what we call downtime cloning. This requires no special tools. Shut down the master copy all the files to the replica, add a recovery.conf, and start them both back up. That actually works, and there are circumstances where that is, in fact, the most sensible route. Um, particularly if you had to shut down the master for some maintenance-related reason. Um, a second one is, if you are using ZFS or LVM or sophisticated SANS or ButterFS or some other form of storage that can take a genuine point-in-time snapshot of a set of files at a single moment, single microsecond in time, then that is a perfectly legitimate way to take a copy of a replica. Like, you export a ZFS snapshot to another machine, that will work as a way to jumpstart a replica. And if you happen to have a centralized storage-based architecture with snapshot-capable storage, that can actually be your best way of taking a replica. Um, the mainstream way to do this is obviously the PG Base Backup Utility. It's a command line tool for cloning. It copies over 5432, so no special SSH or R-Sync or whatever permissions required. Um, it also, depending on the switch you pass, it copies the required logs. Uh, it does require you to have set up streaming replication, so that replication permission, etc. Um, and it actually requires two replication connections because it uses one to copy the database files and one to copy the transaction logs. Now it does have some drawbacks, which is that it can't, it doesn't compress anything, so it's just doing a raw copy of all of the files. And the second one is it can't do any kind of incremental updating the way that you can with something like, say, rsync. That is, it's going to do an entire, you have to clear out the directory, so it's going to do an entire copy of every single file. Which, if you have a two terabyte database, and you need to start a, you know, you need to resync a replica that is only a few hundred megabytes behind, is kind of uh, network intensive. Um, and those are ways to create snapshots. Now, one of the reasons why I'm telling you about these different ways to create snapshots is because we're going to get into different forms, different ways of doing asynchronous replication, particularly archiving replication. So archiving replication refers to replicating Postgres via archive files of data changes rather than um, via a stream. And so the general way to jumpstart archiving replication is you set up all of the archiving machinery. You set up all the archiving settings and configuration. We'll go over that. You do, you tell Postgres that you're taking a backup. You copy all the files. You tell Postgres you're finished taking a backup. Um, and then you bring up the replica. We'll do that interactively. Now, there's a number of reasons why you would do this. Number one, if you have a really large database, and say the replica has been offline for 20 hours and it can no longer catch up with the master. And so you want to resync it, but you don't want to do a full copy of the entire data directory because there aren't that many changes. This happens a lot with data warehousing. So you want to use rsync so you can do an incremental update or some other tool to do an incremental update. Um, so that's one reason to do it. Second reason to do it is you may already have a point-in-time recovery-based backup system, such as Wally or Barman or some other tool that 
does continuous backup for Postgres. And you would like to use that continuous backup to also jumpstart your replicas. Again, this only really makes sense if you have a large database, but, but if you do have a large database, it makes a lot of sense. Another reason you might want to do this is that imagine your master is located here on the ground and your replica is located in the satellite and it only connects, it's only able to connect with the master for three hours out of the day. This is, believe it or not, a real use case um, from NASA. Um, and so in that case, you would much rather ship files, particularly ship files that you can triple check for bit flipping, than to have a streaming connection. Um, also, if you are using Postgres 9.2 or earlier, remastering does not, that is switching masters for a live replica, does not work unless you are also doing archiving. Archiving. Um, my real answer is, if you think you're going to need remastering, please upgrade to 9.3 or 9.4 and your life gets much easier. But sometimes you can't do that. So let's see. We've still got 10 minutes before the Q&A. So let's do a little hands-on exercise with archiving. Okay. So I think we already yeah we already killed PG Bench. So let's go ahead and stop the replica. Okay, and now this is where I jumped ahead to earlier. <laughs> now we really are going to blow away the replica. Okay, and having blown away the replica, we now need to make some changes in the master configuration to turn archiving on. So, so here's the changes we need to do. First of all, there's the setting called archive mode. And archive mode is either on or off. If it's on, you are theoretically doing archiving. Now, archive mode can only be changed with a restart. So what I recommend is when you configure a new master, if you think you might need to use archiving in the future, turn archive mode on and set archive command to something like bin true that always returns true. Because you can change archive command at runtime and if archive mode is always on, you can avoid needing to schedule a downtime for your master, which is nice. But in this case, go ahead and uncomment this. We are setting archive command to a shell script that I have um, on the server um, that archives files. So set up Postgres archive logs sh. And the way that this works here is um, you have these special placeholders that you can pass to the command. And percentage P is the full path to the transaction. So what, what by the way, so what we are archiving is transaction log files. Um, and so percentage P is the full path to the transaction log file. Percentage F is just the file name itself. Uh, the, the percentage P does include the file name. We're passing those things separately so that we don't have to parse out the full path to figure out the naked file name, to figure out the plain file name. So, um, and those are generally, those are the two things that you need in order to populate whatever, whatever script you have. Another thing we're going to uncomment here is archive timeout. So normally... Archive logs get shipped when you fill up a log, which is 16 megabytes. Now, on a high traffic database, you're going to be doing several of those logs per minute, so that's not really an issue. On a low traffic database, it might, or a very small database, it might take you a while to up 16 megabytes. So we have a timeout there that you can set according to whatever your requirements are, which will zero fill a log and send it over even though it's not full yet when the timeout counter counts down. So we've gone ahead and modified that. 
Um, and now we have to restart the master because we turned archive mode on. Oops. What happened there? That's very interesting. Hold on. Oh. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on there. Yeah, but I don't know where it's getting that string from. So just stop it and start it. The start works normally. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure where it's getting that string from and I don't want to troubleshoot it up here in the podium. But if you just go ahead and do stop and then start, that'll work. Um, so we've now turned on archiving. Um, and Postgres has started up a new process called the archiver process that, that is in, in charge of shipping these archive logs. So, switch terminals again. We're going to start back up that benchmark so that we actually have some traffic and we have something to archive. Switch back to Postgres. Connect to the master. We can't connect to the replica right now because the replica is gone. Um, and we're going to tell it we're starting a backup. Now, PG Start Backup requires you to give it a label, which is used in the file name of the backup bookmark file. Um, this label is completely arbitrary. It is for your own use. It can be any string you want it to be. Um, and if you've forgotten whether or not you started a backup, you can use this function pg is in backup, which will tell you whether or not you've started to do a backup. That, that's actually kind of important because since this is related to the transaction log, which is monolithic, you can't actually have two different backup sessions running at the same time. So if you script this automatically, one of the most common reasons for these scripts to fail is that you actually tried to start the backup a second time and the second time will fail. So let's exit out of here. Now, in a real production thing, we would be sending these archive files to the replica or we might be sending them to a cloud storage server or somewhere else that's reasonably accessible. On this demo, of course, <coughs> we're sending them to a local directory, wall archive in the home directory. Hmm. Not seeing anything yet. Hmm? Okay. Oh, okay, so bonus material. Mm. Okay, so one of the other things that happens with archiving a lot is that archiving doesn't work. And the way that you actually check this is by going into Postgres's activity log, um, which is wherever you've configured it to be, often somewhere in var log. So in this case, our, it's in uh, var log Postgres, Postgres QL master. And so here it's telling us that um, archive logs is failing. And the reason why archive logs is failing is because, again, this is my first time doing this on Docker. 
um, and apparently um, rsync did not install um, when I did my last Docker build. What? Yeah, Vagrant will work because rsync is there. Um, on the Docker version, this is going to halt because rsync is not there. And since we only have one minute left before the 10 minutes of Q&A, um, I'm not going to actually try to solve this on, on Vagrant, on Docker, because particularly because I am currently having a problem with Docker and networking. So I know I can't solve this on my particular Docker. Um, if you install rsync, for any of you on Docker, if you go ahead and do app get rsync as root, it should, in app get install rsync as root, it should when start working. When it's uh, copied, the root just work? Just replace rsync with Oh, that's true. Oh, whoops. Don't have permissions. Okay. We're, we're running out of time, so I'm actually not going to troubleshoot this for you. The, um, okay. So this, this ends at three, correct? So that's, that's all we have time for in terms of interactive demos today, interactive hands-on today. Um, there are additional exercises in here, and I will upload yet another updated version to the Docker image that actually has our sync present. Um, if you want to start over, otherwise you can, as suggested, switch to using CP. Um, uh, and there's additional exercises for failover, um, uh, doing dual replication, failover and failback, um, and configuring query lag. A few other last notes for archiving. Um, uh, and, and that's all we have for today, except questions. So, questions. Yeah. So the question is, how much slower is DRBD than Postgres native replication? Um, and the answer is three to four times slower. Here's the reason. Postgres does a lot of writing that is not necessary for preserving your data. And as a result, but because DRBD is doing replication at the file system block level, it has to replicate all of that extra traffic. For example, if you create a temporary table in the master and the temporary table is bigger than your configured temporary table limit, Postgres will write that temporary table to disk. DRBD will have to replicate that temporary table to the DRBD replica, even though it is not readable on the other server. The other big problem with doing DRBD is that you can only have a warm standby. You cannot query in a read-only fashion that other server because the replica does need its own file space that it can write to um, for a bunch of extra temporary information and that sort of thing. Um, and particularly, it needs its own transaction log directory. Um, just on a performance issue, um, I was having a discussion this morning with someone about ext 4 and journaling. Um, do you recommend turning journaling off on, on ext 4 if you run a Yes. The question was if I, we recommended turning journaling off since Postgres has its own journal. Um, and my answer is no, because Postgres's journal will not allow you to recover from some failures that the file system journal can recover from. As in, if your file system ends up corrupted because you're not journaling, then Postgres will not be able to recover that. The only circumstance where I could see doing that is if, is if you were running an ephemeral replica. That is, um, one of the things that people do on Amazon a lot is you run replicas where if, the M, if it shuts down, you don't restart it. You just blow it away and spin up a new instance. In that case, I would turn journaling off, as well as several other things. So in a, in a situation, possibly at 9.5, where you support multi-master replication and synchronous replication, is that 
that lends itself to sort of having two masters running ephemerally yeah. in the cloud. Is that, is that sort of the scenario we go to here? Yeah, so... The question was in with the 9.5 uh, with 9.5's bidirectional replication. Um, does it make more sense? Does does that contribute to the ephemeral? I think it's actually kind of orthogonal because ephemeral replicas make perfect sense with just asynchronous streaming replication. Um, I wouldn't recommend using synchronous replication with an ephemeral replica because what's the point? Synchronous replication is ordered to protect you against data loss, and if it's an ephemeral replica then you're not protected against data loss. I'm just sort of thinking about stateless containers possibly. Yeah. Yeah. And so that would be an example. It's the same idea. Stateless containers is the same idea um, with that. So but, but let's take another question. We had one. Uh, um, I can't recall exact error, but sometime when you have fairly large database in the hot standby and you're trying to take a SQL dump from a hot standby, after some time, it uh, fails uh, with something like uh, data expired or data is not here anymore. Yes. Um, and that's called query cancel. Um, and that's one of the sort of configurable things. So one of the configurable things within... Um, do, 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 do. Uh, within... Uh, replication, which is there are certain operations that the master has to do some of the time, usually garbage collection, which we call mass, we call uh, vacuum, which can interfere with queries running on the replica. And as an administrator, the decision that you have to make on that is do you want to pause replication or do you want to cancel the query on the replica? And that is an operational decision, right? If failover is more important, then you want to cancel the query. If completing the query on the replica is more important, then you don't want to cancel the query. Um, so, okay, I don't have a slide for that right here. The, um, then you don't want to cancel the query. But that's the message that you get when Postgres has decided, hey, um, we need to do a file cleanup vacuum, and a query is running on the replica that is looking at the table that we are in the process of cleaning up, and therefore we're going to cancel that query. If you don't want those cancels to happen, then there are a number of settings that you can change to make that less likely. Um, and if you actually look at the second version of this presentation um, in the GitHub repository, so you go to the GitHub repository right now, and there's a second version of the slides called PG Replication Tutorial 9.4 Plus, um, and that actually has more detailed information about the different settings that you use to configure that cancel activity. Oh, wait, he's got the mic. He's got the mic. Uh, about uh, 9.1 replication. Uh, your masters, the, the slaves out of sync. Um, but I don't want to bring the master down. Um, what can I do? Okay. Um, so the slave's out of sync to the point where it's telling you it can't catch yeah, up, yeah, correct? that's right. Um, well, if you're already in that situation, the answer would be to just run another PG base backup and, and overwrite the replica and bring that up. Okay, and I can do that without, an, uh, yeah. without disturbing the uh, access to the master. Correct. This is all, these are all hot copies. The master is running and processing traffic. The only thing I will say is that taking a copy of the master, like running PG-based backup, that is a significant I.O. hit on the master if you have a large database. Sure. So it doesn't require taking the master down, mm. but it may interfere with concurrent traffic from a performance perspective. Mm. So you might want to wait until whatever your yeah, low traffic time, time is yeah, to yeah. do it. Yeah, got it. Thanks. Um, hi, Josh. I have two questions. The first one is, um, are there still any issues with um, replicating hash indexes? Yes, they still don't work. Um, that's because, well, they still don't work reliably. Here's the, here's the problem with Postgres' hash indexes. No one has ever fixed issues with 
by logging with logging the hash indexes to the transaction log, um, and because they are not properly logged to the transaction log, a lot of things can happen with your hash indexes that can cause them to be effectively useless on the replica. So that is still a problem. And part of the reason why nobody's fixed this is as of Postgres 9.4, gin indexes, which are another type of index, which you can actually implement a hash index on top of, and people have, and contribute, there's something called gin hash, um, are faster than the hash indexes. So there's even less incentive for us to fix them. But, but I'll tell you, those, those are in fact still broken as a concept. All right, I'll have to make an um, upstream thing. The second question, I'm sorry if you answered the start, I was, I was a little bit late. Um, can you just give a brief synopsis, I suppose, of, of, of familiar with PG Barman versus um, the streaming rep and just anything that you can... The, well, the Postgres Backup and Recovery Manager... Okay, uh, so those, they're not, PG, uh, Barman and streaming replication are not alternatives to each other. They're complementary. Barman is for, is for automating and managing continuous backup. And if you really care about your data, you're going to be doing both. You're going to be doing continuous backup and replication, right? Replication for fast failover, continuous backup for recovering from things like administrator error and being hacked and, and software bugs. Um, looking at, this is a question for sort of small business type um, implementations. Um, if you're wanting to do off-site replication, is using Postgres's inbuilt replication a bad idea because of the, the speed you typically get over a internet connection? Um, well, if you're doing off-site replication, it really depends on what your... It, I mean, just compare your data volume with your network bandwidth. Um, I mean, I will tell you that off-site replication over cheap networks is a big reason to do the file-based replication I started to demonstrate, um, because then you have a lot of options for how you're going to ship those files. Um, in an extreme example, the Music Brains Foundation um, for the Music Brain software actually has people download daily packages of replication files from FTP as an example of extremely slow replication. I, I think we're out of time, yes? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll be happy to answer questions, troubleshoot additional exercises after the session outside because someone else will be in this room soon. Okay, thank you very okay. much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, oh, thank you. Gifts. Uh, the next talk will be on 3.40, so hope you'll enjoy the talk. Thank you so much.